So we're going to do something a little bit different this week. Uh, rather than continue in 2 Corinthians, which we've been doing for the last few weeks, we're actually going to take a little bit of a break. And the reason is this, because here's actually a good time now that restrictions are beginning to ease and more of us can be able to meet face-to-face as a church. It's, it's a good time to actually take a pause, to spend a week talking about what that might mean for us as a church, as Southwest, and also for us as individuals, because this will mean something different for perhaps the next few weeks and months. Now, I don't know if you know anything about sailing. Do you know anything about sailing? I don't. I am a complete noob. I have trouble remembering which side is port and which side is starboard. Now, I've heard, though, from my friends who do know something a little bit about, or know a little bit about sailing, that there's something that they do called tacking. It's pretty uh, basic navigation, sorry, basic sailing technique. You see, if you're trying to get from A to B, but the wind is coming at you head on, well, then you can't get from A to B directly, can you? I mean, even noobs like me know that the sail has basically got to catch the wind, not head on, but from behind in some ways to move forward. So when the wind is a headwind, but you're trying to get from point A to point B, then what sailors do is something called tacking. That is, instead of charting a straight line from A to B, they will zigzag, they will tack. And that will enable them to cut across the wind, to catch it in their sails and still move forward. But now it's a zigzag pattern, but eventually they will get from A to B. Now, if you actually know anything about sailing and made a complete hash of that, please forgive me. But it's actually a pretty good illustration for where we're at as a church and what we're going to need to do in the next little while. Basically, we will need to tack. Because COVID and shutdown has meant that we cannot get from A to B directly. Right? The easing of restrictions is not back to normal. In fact, you might have heard of the new popular term, new normal, thrown around everywhere. Well, that just shows that there may not get, we may not be able to get back to the old normal. Or we may not even want to get back to an old normal. So we need to do a few things. And that's what I'm hoping this talk will do for us as a church this week. Now, by the way, if you are not part of SWEC... Uh, you're listening. Welcome. Don't worry. What I'll be saying will still be the kind of things that every church probably will need to think about. And uh, there'll still be Bible in it. So I hope God speaks to you regardless. Now, what I want to be doing is a few things today. First, I want us to think biblically about our destination, right? God's word gives us the destination. It also gives us the compass or the GPS coordinates so that we can get to the right destination. Or we want to be thinking biblically about the destination, where we want to go. But then as the sailing instruction has shown us, we also need to work out how we're going to get there, how we're going to tack, zigzag, since the path from here to destination will not be a straightforward one. Now, again, the Bible is going to be the thing that keeps us on course, even as we tack. So as we apply the Bible, we will look at what it might mean for us as we wait between now and then. All right, so that's what I'm going to be doing. And I have three points. The first two is going to really help us get a sense of the destination. And then what does the Bible say about us as a church, about us as individuals that really we need to keep in mind so that we have the right destination, right? That's points one and two. But then in my final point, we'll be looking at how we're actually going to get there, right? What does the Bible tell us about what we need to keep in mind as we tack, as we zigzag our way to our destination? Well, pray with me so that we can get into this and I can have the wisdom to do this well. Let's pray. Father God, please help me to speak in a way that is uh, easy to understand, that is clear, that is relevant, but most importantly, that is truthful and faithful to your word. So that we as a church, we as individuals, we as listeners may know how we are to live and think in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my first point, my first point is we church. Right? The first thing we need to keep in mind that's going to influence what we say about our destination is we church. Now, if you think the wording of that first point is weird, well, it's weird for a very deliberate reason. And most people think of church, what, as a place you go to, yeah? A building, sometimes even an organization or a denomination. But the Bible speaks of church differently. And most of you listening will know it already. Now, you know that church is not a building, it's not an organization, it's not a denomination. Church is people, it's God's people. So you don't go to church, you are church. 
But there's more than that when it comes to how the Bible speaks about church. Because you see, the word translated church in the Bible, well, that word is even more specific than just referring to God's people. The word church, you see, is actually about a particular activity that God's people do. And it's that that makes them church. You see, in the New Testament, church is a noun with a verbal idea in it. Or to put it in non-techie terms, church is a thing, but key to that thing is an action. Uh, the word church is not a specially religious word in the Bible. It, it just means assembly. It means gathering. It means congregation. And sometimes I wish it were, they were just translated like that. Because you say the word, the English word church, and there's nothing in it that sounds anything verbal, right? But you say assembly, well, you got to assemble, yeah? You say congregation, you got to congregate. You say gathering, and you've got to gather. Now, it's a little bit like the word player. If you said to me, Pete, I'm a basketball player. And then I ask you, oh, great, well, how often do you play basketball? And then you reply, no, I don't ever play basketball. Well, if that happened, I would be right to question whether you are a basketball player at all, right? Because you can't be a player and not actually play at something. Sport, the game, whatever you're supposed to play. Inside the word player is the idea of play. Now, well, here's the thing. You cannot be church without the activity of assembly, of gathering, of congregating. Because right at the heart of the word church is actually a verb, an activity. And so the Bible actually speaks of the birth of the church. Surprisingly, the church was born not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. Did you know that? So in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it's especially clear in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So let, let me show you uh, the English translation of that Greek translation on the screen. Uh, Moses looks back to the gathering of Israel after God rescues them from Israel, uh, sorry, from Egypt, and he brings them before him at Mount Sinai, Moses calls that day what? The day of the church or the day of the assembly. And from that point onwards, the church is always the result of God saving. Right? God saves people so that they would be his people and belong to a community. And he saves this community and people so that they would gather, they would church, they would assemble before him. They can enjoy his presence together, hear his word and respond to his word together. They would worship and serve him with joy together, assembled, gathered. That's the meaning of church. You got it? And it's carried right into the New Testament. And so it's incorrect to say that we go to church as if church is a place. It's much more correct to say that we are the church. But it's perhaps even more correct to say we church. Right? Church is an activity. We do. We gather. We assemble. Now, the implications of this are obviously huge, but at this point, you might be wondering, so do we stop being the church when we're not assembled? Like, do we stop being church Monday to Saturday when we're in our homes or neighborhoods or workplaces or unis and schools? Well, here is where the New Testament takes the idea of the Old Testament church and elevates it, literally elevates it. Now, let me show you a passage from Hebrews chapter 12. Look on the screen. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church or the assembly of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We didn't get to read uh, the paragraph before, but in the paragraph before this bit that we just read, the writer of the Hebrews has just said that our experience as Christians, as the New Testament church, as we come to God as a church, well, it's not like the experience of Israel, the first church in Moses' day. Right? They came and they assembled at the foot of a literal mountain, Mount Sinai or Horeb. But because of their sin and their ongoing sinfulness, they came with fear and trembling. But you see, if you are a follower of Jesus, though, yeah, then through Jesus, you've gone to where Jesus has gone. And where has Jesus gone? To the right hand of God in heaven. And because as his followers, the Bible says we are united to him spiritually by the Holy Spirit. Then like him, then we've come to heaven and we've come then as a people to a heavenly mountain. 
a heavenly city, a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly assembly. That's who we are. That's what we've come to. And it's way better. It's so much more lasting and there is so much more freedom and access to God. See, because Jesus died for our sins in our place and he died to wash us clean forever by his blood and he rose again to guarantee us eternal life. When we come together before God in the heavenly gathering, this is not something we fear. It's something we enjoy. And by the way, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you can be a part of this, this heavenly reality by trusting and following Jesus today. Please connect with us. We'd love to help you do that. Now, coming back, though, though to the idea of church, um, do you see how this heavenly church, this heavenly gathering around the throne of God as Jesus' people, do you see how this makes us a church even when we're not gathered physically, even when we're apart from each other? Yeah? Because that heavenly reality, that spiritual reality, that's the constant. See, from God's perspective, because we are in Jesus, we are united to Jesus, we are his people, we're always already gathered in heaven, assembled as his church, even when we're going about our daily lives. So that answers the, are we still church when we don't gather question, doesn't it? Uh, But it perhaps raises another question. Question is this, well, if we're the church, even when we're not gathered, then why need to gather at all? Well, this answer is the same as the basketball player thing I talked about before, right? I mean, you can be a basketball player when you're not playing basketball. But if you never play, then you cannot apply that title to yourself, can you? Now, the heavenly church, the heavenly assembly must be expressed and enjoyed on earth to be meaningful at all. And that's why apart from Hebrews 12, almost all other references to church in the New Testament is about actual gatherings on earth. The heavenly must be expressed in earthly gatherings. Now, as I say that, I hope you don't see that as some sort of inconvenient obligation. Why can't I just be part of church without ever having to leave my home since I'm part of the heavenly church? No, it's actually a tremendous privilege, not an obligation, not a duty. It's a privilege. The heavenly reality is actually what makes earthly gatherings so special. Because I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Christian life is actually so often about that. It's about experiencing heavenly realities on earth. All the things that I enjoy most as a follower of Jesus is somehow an expression of heaven on earth. I wonder if you know that. I mean, if you've ever felt so close to God, it's because heaven has touched earth. If you've ever experienced how wonderful gathered worship can be or how loving a gathered community can be, it's because of heavenly realities, right? We should want it. We should want to express it as often as we can, not just a couple of times a week, but every opportunity possible, we should want to express it. Small gatherings, large gatherings, right? That's what the first Christians in Acts did, right? In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, every day they met together in the temple courts. And then they also met at homes at night to eat together. They just could not get enough of the earthly church because every time they church together on earth, a little bit of heaven was experienced. I don't know about you, but don't you want that? I do. Okay, so our first destination point has got to be this. We want to keep churching. We need to keep churching. And you cannot church without gathering, right? It's impossible to experience all that God wants for us as his people by being a solo Christian. Now, of course, some and some of you may be due to health reasons or like in other countries where they experience persecution or maybe you can't gather with other Christians as much as you would like to. Now, if that's you, God is so gracious and he will still feed you and care for you and grow you like he does to Christians all around the world, right? He'll still do that in, in, in these extraordinary circumstances. But it shouldn't change the ideal, should it? Now, the ideal has still got to be gathering because that's what church means. We gather, we church. It's not really an optional extra. Now, how great is it, though, that during lockdown, we've been able to still gather via technology online. I cannot imagine what it would have been like 100 years ago during the Spanish flu pandemic, right? Not having the options we have now. But because of technology, because of Zoom, well, we've still been able to gather in ways, in fact, in ways not thought possible. And that's been such a blessing. I mean, for some people, especially with health or travel limitations or stage of life limitations, it's actually meant new ways 
of being part of church. Some of our most elderly, frail members from our Mandarin congregation, they've benefited enormously from being able to stream online gatherings. That's a great thing. But with technology, there are also huge pitfalls, aren't there? And here's one. I'm just going to name one. Uh, here in the West, even before COVID, all right, it's already been tempting, hasn't it, to become a consumer when it comes to church. Right? There's so many churches around every corner of you know, the suburb. It's so easy just to church hop, to church shop. Uh, and with sermons from internationally renowned preachers that I can listen to online or, or um, podcasts, well, I can just listen to them better sermons rather than my pastor from my local church. Right? That was already before COVID. It's called consumerism. Right? Consumerism is when everything is geared towards the satisfaction and the choice of the consumer. And as consumers, well, I look out for me. I find and choose and purchase goods and services that suit me and make me happy. But now with COVID, well, Every church is streaming online, right? Now I get even more choices as a consumer. On any given Sunday, I can switch church services, right? Like channels on a TV. I have a little bit of everything and no one would know. The temptation to be consumeristic about church is now even greater. Now, if you're finding yourself slipping into that, hey, you are not alone. I'm a pastor and I can... I feel sometimes that I'm getting into consumerism when it comes to church. But here's the thing. There's probably nothing more opposite to discipleship, to being a follower, a genuine follower of Jesus. No, nothing more opposite to discipleship than consumerism. Right? Discipleship, becoming a follower of Jesus is about what? Denying yourself, taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. It's totally not about me. It's the opposite of consumerism. And that's why at SWEC, we've deliberately steered towards online church that's small group based. You notice that? Right from the very beginning, we've done that Zoom, small group based online church. And that's been harder for people just to drop in and stay anonymous, right? Because if you're going to be part of my small group or part of Zoom church, you can't just stay invisible and not participate. You now, you might have questioned why we did it like that rather than just like our Easter service stream to everyone and make it accessible to everyone. Well, we may have made streaming harder for everyone, outsiders, but, you know, we've done this so that we would not get into a habit of thinking of church as consumers. But even so, even so, this is something that we've actually got to actively fight. All right. Consumerism. It's hard to fight. We're just in it all the time. But whatever course we steer as we think about gatherings post-COVID, it's got to be away from consumerism and towards discipleship. All right, that was a long first point, shorter second one coming up. All right, the first guiding principle that helps us about our destination is we church. Church right, is a verb. It's about gathering and assembling and congregating together. But does it have to be physical? I mean, why not just keep church online? That's still gathering, right? Well, it is. Online gathering still gathering, absolutely. But that's why we need our second biblical truth to inform our destination. The second one is this. We are bodies. All right, we are bodies. The Bible's view of the human person is that we are bodies. Not just that we have bodies, but that we are bodies. What I'm trying to express is this. Our existence as human beings is necessarily bodily. And in the Bible, that is a good thing because it's what we were created to be. It's actually the ancient Greeks in the West and uh, Buddhism and Hinduism in the East that downplay the importance of bodies. According to them, we're essentially, human beings are essentially souls or minds or spirits. And our bodies are like inconvenient containers that we got to walk around in. But the ideal would be that we would shed our bodies or transcend our bodies and become pure soul or pure mind or pure spirit. That's their definition of heaven or nirvana or enlightenment. Now, these philosophies, especially the Greek ones, have influenced Christian thinking, but you need to know they are not biblical. They are not. In the Bible, you see, God created human existence to be bodily. Just think about it. When God came to rescue and redeem the world through Jesus, God the Son became flesh. He became fully human, bodily. He died in the body. He was raised again bodily in a new body. 
And his promise is that one day his followers will also be raised bodily, that we will inhabit a renewed physical creation with new resurrection bodies just like his. Right? There is nothing biblical about the, the, the ultimate hope of, of leaving our bodies to float around in, in heaven. Right? That is not the Bible. So in the Bible, what we do with our bodies matter. Because the body is not just some inconvenient thing that gets in the way. Human existence is bodily. That's why the language of worship is so body involved. I mean, the Bible speaks of, read the Psalms, bent knees, lifted hands, clapping hands, praising lips. And that's why baptism and Holy Communion are God's means of grace to us because they're physical among other things. They involve all the senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, hearing. They are bodily expressions of faith. When it comes to church gathering, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, you don't have to turn to it, but he says there that he longs to gather with believers face to face. And we also read that in 3 John, right? The writer John doesn't just want to write to them. He wants to talk face to face with them. The body is important. It's especially important when it comes to churching or gathering. Now, I think we all know this. I think we're beginning to feel it even more so after months of Zoom and online gatherings, right? I don't know about you, but I really want to be able to shake hands and high five and hug there's something so important about actually being with you face to face. And I just cannot subs be substituted by technology. So whatever our destination and however we might use technology post-COVID to help those who can't easily meet in person with us, we've got to hold on to the biblical ideal, don't we? Church is gathering and this gathering needs to be in person. It needs to be bodily. Now, here's one more important reason why. You might have heard the, the, the saying, mind over body. And of course, that's true to a certain extent. But it's also misleading too, isn't it? Because it's not only the mind that affects the body as if it only goes one direction. No, no, no. Our bodies, as you know, affect our minds as well. Uh, you especially know this if you've ever struggled with mental illness, depression, mood disorders. You'll know that, you know, you also need to get enough sleep, yeah? And watch your diet. Get out there. Actually exercise. Because our bodies and what we do with our bodies, it affects our mood, it affects our thinking, it affects our feelings. And here's something you may not have realized. What, what we do with our bodies actually will shape our habits. They will shape our habits. And habits, well, they form character eventually, don't they? So here's the thing. Online church can be so easy and so effortless. All right? You can roll out of bed. Stay in bed, right? You don't have to even have your camera on, so forget about changing out of your PJs or looking even presentable. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's never okay to do that. I mean, who hasn't gone on a Zoom meeting and actually been in their PJs? But have you thought about, though, how what we do with our bodies during online gatherings, online church, actually affect the way we begin to think about and feel about church? And then if we do this week after week after week, what kind of habits are now being created? And then here's a really scary thought. How do these new habits then eventually shape character? See, I don't have to make as much of an effort with online church, do I? I mean, so what I do with my body, even if I know in my mind that it's just temporary, what I do with my body, well, that begins to shape and reshape thinking, create new habits. It actually reinforces the consumerism that we might be trying with our minds to fight. So without intending to, gathering to worship and study the Bible now becomes something that I can easily fit around me. And the whole idea of having to make an effort to gather and worship well, becomes more and more a distant reality. You know, it is not just you, okay? It's me as well. Let me make a confession. On Tuesday, um, our staff team decided finally to meet in person. We would meet at church as a, for our staff meetings. Um, but of all the Tuesdays, it happened to be the wettest and coldest one there was. And I really found it so hard to do that instead of just staying warm at home and dry over Zoom. It's hard. I know that. So let me encourage you with this. All right. Even now during stage two, when our services are predominantly online, even then, think about what you're doing with your bodies. 
it actually matters, right? Not to get into the habit of staying in bed in your PJs. You know, you reach over to your phone like you would in the morning just to check WhatsApp and it's just kind of like there and you know, face. Let your body lead your mind in what we're supposed to be doing when we gather. I mean, think about this, right? Remember Hebrews 12. We're expressing heavenly realities. We are about to come together as God's holy people, redeemed by Jesus' blood. We are about to worship the King of Kings and engage with the God of the universe. We're about to hear the word of our Creator. We're about to sing praises to God our Father. We're about to intercede for our needy world and come before His throne of grace. These are weighty realities. So what kind of bodily expressions are appropriate even when we're online? What we do with our bodies matter. And so that's why we need to have a destination that encourages not just gatherings, but bodily, physical gatherings. And then finally, as I said, the route from A to B will need to involve some tacking. We will need to zigzag there. And so my third point, we are not there yet. We're not there yet. I've said it before in my hello addresses, but the road back out of COVID is going to be much longer than the one in. All right, stage two might only last for a few weeks, okay? More restrictions on numbers will ease probably, and maybe even by July we'll be able to have 100 instead of just 50 people meet on site, and we may be able to resume normal kind of on in-person services and all that kind of stuff. But I need you to know this. Even then, it won't be our destination, all right? We may be in stage three for a while yet, which means physical distancing measures, hygiene measures, not being able to sing, perhaps, together. That might last a long time. Who knows how long that'll go for? So we need to chart a course to our destination of being church, right? Being gathered, physical church. We need to chart a course to that, but it's not going to be straightforward. So what do we do since we're not there yet? What do we do while we wait? What guiding principles do we have as we tack? Well, Thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about what God's people do as they wait. Not specifically about COVID, but about waiting in general. Because the whole Christian life, you see, is about waiting. Like I said last week, um, we live by faith, not by sight. And living by faith is essentially waiting. Waiting for certain and true promises and realities to be fulfilled. Now, the New Testament often summarizes life as a Christian life as we wait with three words. I wonder if you can guess what those three words are. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. Yeah, got that? Faith, hope, and love. So let's use them. Well, the first thing we need to do as we wait is be faithful. Now, in the New Testament, the word faith is the same as the word faithful because a person living by faith will live faithfully. Being faithful here, being faithful does not mean we try to do everything, okay? Being faithful is recognizing our limitations. Whether these limitations are, are from outside circumstances such as COVID or come from health regulations or they may be personal inside circumstances such as our health or other things. Now that's the other reason why we read 3 John earlier. Without going into detail, you'll see how much John, the writer, commends his friend who he's writing to. And he tells them that he's been faithful. Right? You see that in verse 3, you see that in verse 5. Read it again later. Faithfulness recognizes that we serve a good father, but we're actually going to have to give an account to our father one day for how we've acted, what we've done in the time we've been given, in the circumstances we're in. So have a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So what I want to be hearing from God one day at the end of all this is, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. In spite of all that's happened, well done. Because you've been faithful. You've done as much as you could with all the limitations from COVID, with all the uncertainty, with all the churches closing down. Perhaps for some of you, it's even though you've lost your job, even though you've struggled with fear and loneliness and isolation, you have been faithful. Isn't that what you want to be hearing from our Heavenly Father one day? So what will it mean for you, for you to be faithful between now and our destination? That's the question we all need to be asking ourselves. And of course, that's going to look different for different people, right? I mean, if you are a healthy single person with your own apartment to live in, a means of transport, faithfulness will look different for you than it will for the young family with a newborn, a few other young kids, 
Right? Faithfulness will look different for you, if that's you. Or if you're someone living with or caring for someone who's elderly or vulnerable health-wise, or you yourself have health risks, again, that will look different to be faithful. And so you will need to think about what it looks like for you. you do it with prayer, right? seeking God. Do it with your Bibles open. And please do it talking to your brothers and sisters for advice, for counsel, right? to be accountable. But if I can encourage everyone to do one thing, no matter what circumstances you're in, one thing as you consider what faithful looks like for you, let me encourage everyone to take at least one step towards our destination. As we tack to go in the right direction, even if it's just one step. So our goal, our destination is to gather as a church in person. So what would one step for you out of isolation and lockdown, what would one step for you look like? Now, for some of you, that will mean you actually will make the effort along with your community groups to all meet together on site at church or even in the park as you do Bible study, as you do even online Sunday worship at this point in time. Now for others, that's not going to be really possible. So for you is to invite someone else over from your CG um, or to invite yourself over to someone else's house from your CG so that you can do the small group Zoom together on, on Sundays. Now, for others, and maybe just a few of you, but still, it may not be possible to do even that. And so for for you, you'll just need to make that midweek appointment with someone from church um, to to pray together, read the Bible together, encourage each other, maybe go for coffee, go for a play date, go for a prayer walk. All right, but what's one single step towards physical gatherings with other Christians? What will that look like for you as you think about being faithful? All right, that's the first thing, faithfulness. The second is hope hope in that we ought to eagerly desire long to be together again that's what the bible means by hope it's not wishful thinking it's 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 desiring it's longing for the future so don't get comfortable right this is not our destination even when we get to stage three and can get most people together on site that will not be our destination so will you hope will you long long to gather in person to sit close to someone else again, even in church, long to be able to hug and shake hands. And if it's the thing you want to do, you can wholly kiss each other, right? Long to be able to sing your lungs out with people all around you singing together. Long to be able to watch your kids make a mess with other kids, right? Long for that. Hope. Don't stop longing. And finally, love. The most important thing is to consider others' needs before our own because consumerism is all about me and my needs, right? Love is about you and we before me. What's best for another and what's best for the church as a whole may actually inconvenience you, but love will drive you to doing that. Or maybe what works for everyone and what you end up doing and it works for you Well, it may not work for the most vulnerable amongst us. So even as we go along with certain things as a church, I must not make those who can't do that, I must not judge them or make them feel condemned because that's unloving. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, let's pray. Father, please help us. Help us to be a faithful, hopeful, loving church as we chart a zigzaggy course towards our destination. Keep us faithful to you in where you want to take us and help us to get there together, having grown as Christians and also having seen the gospel grow with those who do not yet know you. We can't do any of this, Father. We are so weak And so powerless, but you can do all things. And so choose to use us, even these decisions that we make right now. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, this is a really good week to um, not just leave it at this, but have that discussion about faithfulness. So here's a discussion question for you, if you're able to do it in your small groups. What will taking a step forward in faithfulness mean for you and perhaps for your family at this particular time? Right, well, we're taking a step forward in faithfulness, me, for you and your family at this particular time. Well, God bless you. Thanks for joining us. And we'll be back in 2 Corinthians next week. Bye.